Science. Gosh, that's a good word, good word isn't it? I think of science less as a noun and more as a process. Um, those of you engaged in research will know that good researchers are absolutely anal about how they go about it, about the rigor and the detail and getting it right. What's the research question? What's the methodology? What's the process of finding out how best to answer that question? It's going to be different if you're looking at a hy new hypertensive drug compared to looking at um, patients' reactions to a new diagnosis of Parkinson's. It'll be defined, the process will be defined by the question. And when you're critically reading, I guess you will critically read, you look at the question, you look at how it's been answered, and then you look at how the actual research process was executed. That, to me, is what science is all about. And it can be about molecules, it can be about drugs, it can be about clinical practice, it can be about public health. In fact, public health is probably one of the places where research is done best. But it's about the question and about the way it was answered. If you look at the titles of the talks today, all the ones that I went to speakers to ask them to address have got question marks at the end. So I'm asking them to address a difficult area in their own way and to go off at tangents, as we saw last night with the uh, has drug tra treatment changed in Parkinson's, um, to answer it in their own way. Your job, assuming we've got time, is to ask them questions. So they've turned up, they're happy to answer questions, there'll be no empty podium, so everyone's up for answering questions uh, as long as we've got time. So I want you to try and just capture uh, what's been said and if we do have time to fire questions back again. So that's the plan. Is that okay? Yeah. Right, so let's kick off first session. Um, Baz, um, slight change of uh, subject, but I suspect fairly seamless from last night's wonderful scene setting talk. Um, the floor is yours. The topic, non-pharmacological therapies. Is this an evidence-free zone? Yeah, I liked uh, the title. So, um, feels like I was here just a minute ago, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, a couple of whiskeys in between, though. So, uh, as I said last night, Peter, I'm really here to learn from differences, being really impressed with the Neurology and Parkinson's Academy, and um, I think by learning from each other, um, we can bring greater benefits to both sides of the lake, and I hope to take home as much new knowledge as I hope to bring uh, to England. So our tulips, your architecture, and anything else. So w why are we talking about non-pharmacological therapies and, and evidence? Um, I think Parkinson's is the one disease that is really incredibly complex. It's complex in terms of its presentation, variation between patients, um, the nature of the treatments, the response to the treatments, the risk of adverse effects. One of the reasons for the complexity, of course, this is a cartoon coming from uh, Bill Langston's paper in uh, the Annals of Neurology, is we always tend to look at the superficial end of Parkinson's, which is the motor symptoms, but below the surface, obviously, is the wide range of non-motor symptoms, which are early, common, debilitating, and that m most of them, not all of them, don't respond as well to the dopaminergic treatment. In fact, they can be made worse <coughs> by dopaminergic treatment. So this is one of the most famous Dutch people in history, Hansje Brinker. Um, do you know the story of Hansje Brinker? At one point, uh, the dike was about, you know, the Holland is below sea level, so the, the dike, there was a hole in the dike, and Hansje Brinker was the f legendary boy who put his finger in the dike to pretend, protect the country from flooding. But as you can see, he's actually calling out for help. Um, so I think the average neurologist feels like Hansje Brinker trying to prevent this flood of problems in, in your Parkinson patient by just giving dopaminergic drugs, um, which is clearly not enough. And if we just go back to, I think it's beautiful that Charcot already in the 19th century said that medicine should borrow from other disciplines. And at the time, of course, medicine meant neurology care. So Charcot was really very advanced in his way of thinking and already advocated that we should adopt a multidisciplinary team approach. And I'll just highlight one particular patient to you that I find fascinating as an illustration. As you know, you felt yesterday I love cases, and I'll large my presentation, which is about evidence at the group level with individual cases. So this lady is one of my patients. Uh, she's had Parkinson's for just about 11 years. The other little thing about Parkinson's, little tips and tricks, is the honeymoon, to my mind, on average, 
there is no average patient, is about 10 years. So 11 years is the period when cognitive decline becomes cumbersome, autonomic problems become cumbersome. So after 10 years is, is when the difficult times arise, and she's no exception. And she told me that she has a debilitating uh, problem in the morning, and she feels terrible. But of course, during your typical 10, 15 minute consultation, you know, you can't see those fluctuations. So I do what I usually do, I said, do a home video when you're good, and do me a home video when you're bad. So this is when she's good, uh, and feeling uh, much better. Um, it's a Parkinsonian gait, it's a little arm swing, but it's actually not all that bad. So this is her feeling good, and now this is her home video when she's bad. <laughs> and how illustrative is that? I had expected to see freezing, lots of tremor, maybe dyskinesias. It's identical. So clearly what she is referring to is a non-motor fluctuation. So we ended up sending her home with an ambulatory blood pressure measurement, and this is the typical, typical, this is really early in the morning, this is exactly when blood pressure tends to dip in people with orthostatic hypotension. And it turned out that she actually complains about orthostatic hypotension. And what I learned from really top-notch autonomic people is that Parkinson's is a rather unique disease where you can have not enough blood in your brain to think properly or to feel well, but enough not to faint. So a typical story in Parkinson's patients is they sit on the edge of the bed for nocturia, and they just sit there, they don't faint, but they can't think properly. And the spouse says, what are you doing sitting on the, on the edge of the bed? And you need to lie them down flat, and then they are okay. So indeed, the only remedy that she found was lying down flat. And just as an illustration for multidisciplinary care, so what can you do about orthostatic hypotension? You can adjust the medication, reduce dopaminergic drugs, or maybe provide mitrodina or... Uh, fludrocortisone, so I usually do that with a general medicine doctor, or a, in your country, uh, a geriatrician, of course. Um, I learned from our autonomic people that drinking a large glass of ice-cold water on the empty stomach in the early morning triggers a vasovagal reflex that helps to combat uh, orthostatic hypertension throughout the remainder of the day. That's interesting. Adding extra salt, hypertension is probably the least of their problems if they faint and fracture a hip they're done, so a bit of hypertension is probably okay, recumbent hypertension. And then this is interesting, the single most effective intervention in our hands is raising the cranial end of the bed. And uh, a crate of Heineken is just about the right height. <laughs> uh, but you have to dose it, so you start with half a crate, and then you increase it to a whole crate. But the, but the serious thing is, it means your bladder is now below the heart, it reduces nocturia, so there's more circulating volume in the morning. And in our experience, this is a very effective intervention. It's not just tilting the head at the cranial end, it's really raising the cranial end of the bed. And remember the Heineken cartoon. And physios can do this, anti-orthostatic maneuvers. Use the pump, your leg pump, the muscle pump, to bring back the blood to where it belongs in the brain, rather than having it sink into the legs. And this comes from a chapter we did, um, and these people know, because they're using the muscle pump all the time, so these, the, the guards, um, uh, the, the Queen's guards, they, they tend to faint because they have to stand as still as possible, but secretly they're actually squeezing the quadriceps and calf muscles, so they know these tricks in order to prevent this. Um, so multidisciplinary team care, this comes from a paper we did in the BMJ, these were about 19 professional disciplines that can be involved in Parkinson's care. This is obviously not to say they should always be involved, and certainly not all at the same time. Uh, but these are just examples. And we just published another paper that we labeled the new kids on the block, because we realized that there is actually even more disciplines. The longer I look at Parkinson's, the complexer the disease becomes. And uh, we published this in um, Expert Review of Neurotherapeutics. And I agreed with Sarah that I will share all the relevant PDFs with, with all of you uh, that I'll mention in my talk, and the same applies for yesterday. And these are the, the other disciplines that I think we were missing out on our initial review in the British Medical Journal. Think of a dentist, think of a pulmonologist, think of a gastroenterologist, there are a, a vascular doctor, a general medicine doctor. Um, it has the geriatrician, because in the Netherlands, 
uh, geriatricians are not routinely involved. We are a very different country from the UK. Um, Neuro-ophthalmologists, we have a big PhD project now on um, ophthalmological problems. For example, we talked about visual cueing, and we'll talk about visual cueing later, but if you don't see the visual cues, and Parkinson patients have about 10 reasons for a bad vision, you won't benefit from visual cueing. And the, 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 the most important new kid on the block is the patient. So I think modern time and era is we don't look after our patients, we work together with our patients. So this is one of my favorite photos that we took in our team. And we literally have our team meetings with the patient present sitting at the table. So we don't talk about the patient, we talk with the patient. And that time investment pays itself off in the long term. We're actually quite convinced. So I was asked by Peter to talk about evidence-based medicine. And the first thing I wanted to flag is this paper in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine by Jan van der Broeke. And Jan van der Broeke was a former editor-in-chief for uh, The Lancet, an epidemiologist from Leiden, where I was trained uh, as a young doctor. And Jan, actually, in this paper, emphasizes the importance of individual observations in single cases. People always tend to say, ah, uh, an, an N is one observation doesn't count, it's no evidence. And Jan says that's not true. It is evidence. It's the lowest grade of evidence, but it is actually evidence. And it's a source of inspiration for further research. And in fact, if you now look at the world of clinical trials, um, we are now moving away from grand averages in large RCTs at the group level, moving much more towards N is multiple, N is one studies. So this is a paper in Nature outlining how the new design is you give a drug to a person, then placebo, then the drug, then placebo, and person A responds each time he gets the real stuff and doesn't respond to placebo, patient B doesn't. We tend to now lump them all together, take the grand average, but these multiple NS1 designs are very interesting. So again, Alan, thinking of your work on the GDNF trial, should you redo the study at the group level or looking at these individual responses, should you go towards different? And I think the, the device actually would lend itself well for a multiple NS1 design, because you could switch, alternate Verum with placebo, which would be really interesting. Now, evidence for these team approaches is growing. These are examples of guidelines uh, developed by my own team. Uh, a lot of those, many of those are available in English. They're downloadable for free on the ParkinsonNet website. Um, Probably the uh, Parkinson's Academy could just put them on their own site. Um, so these are examples of uh, guidelines. Um, and what is interesting is, although the evidence is growing, that's the good news, I, st I think there's still a lot of room for improvement. We did this paper in the Movement Disorders Journal not too long ago, and this is just highlighting on the y-axis the number of participants in the studies. So there are a few studies with a few hundred patients, but most studies are typically 10, 20, 30 patients. So most of the, and these are all studies on OT, speech and language, dance, exercise. So most studies are small sized, with a few exceptions. And this is on the y-axis now, the study duration. And most studies tend to be very brief. Few exceptions that go to two years, but many studies is just a few weeks. So to see your patient improve with a physiotherapy intervention for just a few weeks is maybe good and well. What we're interested in is the long-term effect. So good news is evidence is growing, but methodological quality is still um, a lot of room for improvement. And this is something that I find really interesting, and this should really appeal to the Parkinson's Academy. I, I published this editorial in the Lancet Neurology following a paper that we did on, on occupational therapy and what the insurers, the payers, probably the NHS, tends to do is say, give me the evidence first before I will reimburse multidisciplinary care. The problem is, in order to do a good physiotherapy trial, you need dedicated experts in physiotherapy to deliver the intervention. So what we reason in this paper is that you should probably invest in education, as the academy is doing, Make sure that you have well-trained personnel who can then deliver the intervention at a high end. And obviously, if your trial is subsequently negative, you may have to bin your concept or redesign. But I think we shouldn't always wait for the evidence, but sometimes invest in education um, and then make sure you do a proper trial. And 
One example of where this went wrong uh, is um, this paper um, led by Carl Clark um, in, in JAMA Neurology. So Carl has done wonderful work, I can't emphasize that enough, wonderful work on large-scale clinical trials in Parkinson's. He's been really leading the field. Probably his least successful trial, in my perspective, was this paper in JAMA Neurology. It was a negative study showing that physiotherapy combined with occupational therapy added no benefit to Parkinson patients, which of course was a disappointment to the field. And I felt compelled to write a letter to the editor um, in JAMA Neurology highlighting the many flaws in this study. Um, again, I'm saying this with the deepest respect for the Birmingham group, but this study was not the best in its kind because they included, they excluded patients with an indication for physiotherapy or occupational therapy. So they only included patients without a need for the treatment. <sighs> then they had four interventions, one of which was education, spread over the combination of OT and PT. So they had at best one physiotherapy session and one OT. That's not enough. And then the therapists were not well trained. They were generically active therapists who were doing all sorts of things, lower back pain, pulmonary problems, orthopedic problems, and a bit of Parkinson's. And they used an outcome which had not been validated for Parkinson's. So if anything, this trial was valuable for highlighting the challenges in studying allied health interventions. That to my mind is the key message of this paper. This is not, levodopa versus placebo. This is a complex intervention that depends on human beings of flesh and blood that need to be compared to a proper placebo. And that's challenging. So again, I don't think this shows physio doesn't work. It shows the challenges of trials. And just a few general remarks before I give. This gentle, oh, can we have the sound or is it? So this is freezing of gait, mm -hmm. and that's freezing of speech. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just showing this to say that there are similar problems across different disciplines, and I think I already highlighted yesterday how tricks that we can use to improve gait, and we'll come to that in a minute, yeah, yeah. same yeah. tricks can be used to help improve speech, uh, for example, or swallowing. And this is the paper I forgot to include in my presentation last night, and I will send you the PDF. This is a really nice paper Jorik Nonnekes did in my group in JAMA Neurology, where we summarized the hundreds of videos I have on my laptop of the compensatory strategies, and we identified five main groups, each with 10, 20 variants. And we did this, A, as a tribute to patients, to their creativity and their resilience, B, as a source of material for therapists um, so they can try all these hundred different solutions with their patients in a systematic fashion, which is one of the studies we're now about to start in the Netherlands. Uh, and also it's inspirational for neuroscientists to see how the brain works, how the brain overcomes deficits in automatic motor behavior. So this is a, it's a very nice paper, I think, and it's larded with videos. So, and they're all, you can find those on the website of JAMA Neurology. And I showed this last night, I'm just showing it again, that these compensatory strategies are the basis for many of the allied health interventions that I will be talking about next. The other question I often get is, what about Parkinsonism? What about MSA, PSP, CBD, etc.? Poorly studied, very few studies. We just had a paper submitted on physiotherapy for multiple system atrophy. This is a, a book, and we did a book chapter on um, why we think that many of the interventions designed for and tested in people with Parkinson's can be applied to patients with Parkinsonism. The caveat being, A, that it's more rapidly progressive, cognitive decline is more common, but I think in general, most of the work that I will be presenting although it's been tested in Parkinson's, I think could and should be tried in your patients with atypical Parkinsonism as well. So physiotherapy, I think the evidence is strongest. This is a guideline I'm particularly proud of. It's available in English. It's downloadable for free. It's the European guideline of physiotherapy for Parkinson's. And what I like about this guideline is this is the bit for the physios. Don't even read it. This is the physio bit. But there is a little manual for you as physicians 
giving you guidance when and where to refer your patients. And there's a little manual for patients, what they can expect from a physiotherapist. It's a really nice guideline. It's all in, available in English and it's downloadable for free um, from this website. And this is what physios can do. Um, education and coaching is throughout the disease trajectory. Exercise is something we should do early and obviously you'll stop it when patients become unstable. Practicing, strategy training, and of course adapting the environment. Um, and those are the domains that um, are uh, highlighted in this European guideline and you, know, you can read it if you like, but I think all you need to remember is that if you see problems in one of those domains, a well-trained physiotherapist who reads and uses the guidelines can offer benefit to your patients with reasonably good evidence now. So one example is cueing, um, visual cueing. Uh, there's also auditory cueing and other types of cueing. So this is a lady having great difficulty uh, crossing a doorway, and uh, this is her with a, just a single red stripe. She looks at it, steps over it, and it, it's markedly effective. There is now class two evidence for cueing. There is visual cueing, there is auditory cueing. Um, and what is interesting, we'll come to that in a minute, um, not every patient responds to the same type. So there are people who really want auditory cueing, others like visual cueing, and it's, it's not necessarily interchangeable. Both have the problem that they are very visible to patients. So if you have a visual cue, everybody can see you're using a visual cue. If you walk around with earbuds, you can... So we're now doing a new study funded by the Fox Foundation with tactile cueing, rhythmic um, tactile cues delivered to the feet, because it's an invisible way of, and maybe more socially acceptable. This is a wonderful man, he's got uh, Parkinson's and he's into his 80s, he's a, a former architect and designer. He built this himself, he calls this his inverted walking cane, um, which works well on the tiles but not in the grass, so this is his walking ladder as he labels it himself. So this is serial queuing now, we had, in his house he's nailed his bars to the floor but now his wife stumbles over these obstacles. <laughs> So that's material for the OTs. He climbs stairs all day, uh, which he finds very effective. And he can ride a bicycle, which we saw yesterday, which you can now see is a very consistent finding. Now, this is the same guy. We published this. Some of you may have seen it, but I find this so fascinating. So I brought this guy to the hospital to do a demo video for the physios in our network. And this is what the guidelines tell you to do. Put tape on the floor at a fixed distance. This is the same guy with the walking ladder. And it doesn't, it doesn't work. I said, come on, taken the day off, done everything we needed. He said, no, there must be a height. And without a height, it doesn't work. So we replaced the stripes with bars, and now he goes. Isn't that wonderful? And you see guidelines crumble in front of your face and patients telling us how to do it. The, the, the message is that the height probably is greater incentive to, it's a more powerful visual cue, probably. And this is the final anecdote, and then we'll come to the evidence. This man comes, actually, actually I found him on YouTube, which is interesting, um, connected to his, his niece, um, who's now an author on this paper. So he has great difficulty walking, but what he can do is climb stairs, is what he does all day. But obviously, the, you, know, the, you don't have staircases everywhere in your house. So what his niece has done, and she's an artist, she's painted a three-dimensional illusion of a staircase on the floor, which allows him to walk. So, isn't that amazing? And now what she's done is painted these staircases throughout the house, and what she, what she actually does is, these are three printed 3D carpets, um, and she gives it away for free to patients across the world, and all she wants in return is not money, but a video of the patient being improved. How about it? Good things happening. So, obviously, these, this is all examples of visual cueing, but you don't have your visual cue always with you. So, Muriel Farai, in my own group, with her father, invented the, the cue shoe. And the, the, the mechanism is, the heel touches the floor, there's a laser beam attached to the nose of the shoe that projects a red line, so now this foot can step over the laser beam, and when that foot hits the floor, the story repeats itself. So now you have your ambulatory visual cue with you all the time. So we've got this beautiful uh, male model and a female model, and it looks extremely handsome, as you can see. 
And this is a man with Parkinson's, and I always find it fascinating. Artificial as it may be, we reproduce the cramped environment, he gets stuck. So this is typical freezing, and now you see the laser, can you see the laser beams on the floor? And now it allows him to walk. In fact, this man refused to give us back the laser shoes because he was so happy. Some patients prefer to step over the laser beam, others prefer to step towards the laser beam. There's another interesting thing, I won't play the video again, but you know what I find fascinating? Is he actually walks like this. He doesn't look at the stripes, but the, the sheer knowledge that they are there to help him alleviates the anxiety. We talked about anxiety last night, and it's enough, it's there if needed. But he doesn't really look at it all the time, which I find really fascinating. It's just a knowledge that it's there. So we published a paper just recently in neurology. Um, this was a lab-based study, um, just as you saw in the video. Uh, this is gait scores and um, uh, off and on medication, and it works both on and off medication. Slightly better off medication, which is good. So this is when you need it most, when the medication isn't working. There's a benefit of the laser shoes. And it also helps for freezing with, again, a more dramatic effect in the off phase. And then we sent people home with the laser shoes, and there was a reduction in falls. In all this is a paper we published in the Movement Disorders Journal. In all fairness, it was a relatively brief intervention, only one week at home, so this is early days. I'm not saying this is the penultimate evidence, but it's encouraging. And when we stopped the intervention, falls went back up, although near falls continued to go down, which may be in the best case, an after effect, or maybe this is just showing that patients behaved more carefully because they were now triggered about being part of a false intervention study. So, interesting material. There is an English company based in London called the Pathfinder that puts these on the market. Uh, not all patients are very keen about it. I think it's, it's promising. It's not for all your patients, but certainly for some of them it can be useful. Now, these are rodents with MPTP-induced Parkinsonism. This is work by Giselle Petzinger in Los Angeles. And this mouse exercises every day, and this MPTP mouse exercises never, and just sits in its cage all day. And the exercising Parkinson mouse is both much fitter, it looks much better, and when you kill the mouse and look at the brain, there is sprouting of the dopaminergic neurons, there is hypersensitivity of dopamine receptors, and there is inhibition of the glutamatergic inhib inhibitory system. Now, a mouse is not a human being, but it's, it's, it's interesting and compelling, and who knows, exercise could be disease-modifying, neuroprotective, whatever word you like to use. So, talking about exercise, this is one of the nicer studies I've seen in a long time, um, and it's one of the first studies where they looked at the dose so the interesting thing is, we put a drug on the market, if we look at um, dose and adverse effects, and, and actually if you look at exercise, um, before we can prescribe exercise as an intervention, we should look at, for example, the dose. So they were the first to look at the dose, and this is interesting. This is, they had a, a group training at low intensity and a group training at the high intensity, and you can see from their heart rates that their intervention was very successful. They successfully separated the two groups, paper in JAMA Neurology. And this is the outcome. Um, there was a placebo group, uh, unusual care, and the higher the dose, the higher the intensity, so the volume was the same, but the intensity was higher. The higher the intensity of your exercise, the greater the benefit. So this is the first dose-finding study in the world of exercise for Parkinson's. It's a very important study, I think. Well-designed, good work. Um, there are anecdotes of patients who overdo it. I often get the question, is there a limit? And I don't know, but I know of patients who run marathons every day who actually get worse. Uh, maybe Parkinson patients who have a problem in their mitochondrial household shouldn't overdo their exercise. So my, my take is, I recommend my patients to do something every day for 30 to 45 minutes. And why every day? Then there's no ifs, ands, or buts. Otherwise, you can always say there's tomorrow. I tell my patients every day, and then you have to do it. So this is a paper where I was an author. It's a paper in The Lancet, and it was also a very interesting study. It was called the V-Time study. 
And the essence of this study is we, it was a hospital-based intervention on a treadmill where people either had an aerobic exercise on the treadmill or the matched control group or the intervention group had the same amount of aerobic exercise but was now submerged in a virtual environment with the idea that multimodal brain stimulation is better at driving brain plasticity. So, um, well, this is the design. There were people with mild cognitive impairment, Parkinson's, and elderly fallers. So it's either treadmill training alone or treadmill training plus VR, virtual reality. And this is how it looks like. They're walking on the treadmill and they have to make sure they don't bump into a bystander or have to step over, uh, in this case, water on the floor. And you'll see he's not extremely successful at it. So multimodal brain stimulation. And the primary outcome was falls. And these are both active interventions. And they both lead to a reduction in falls, but it's a statistically significant benefit in favor of multimodal brain stimulation. So very interesting work um, showing, um, again, the value of exercise for people with Parkinson's disease. It was also a deeply frustrating study. My PhD student nearly committed suicide, really, because this was an inter intervention where patients had to come to the hospital three times a week. And patients like to exercise, but they want to exercise at home. They don't want to go to the hospital or even to the gym three times a week. So this is our alternative. Uh, this was a, a, it's a design paper in BMC Neurology on the Park in Shape study. And the Park in Shape study was different because we brought stationary bicycles into the patients' homes. So now they could exercise at home, not having to go to the gym or to the hospital. And it was a very clever design where we had remote control. We could download the data to check for compliance. So if patients were no longer exercising, we could see it and ring them up. Conversely, if they got fitter, we could turn the knob and make the exercise more strenuous without them knowing. So that was really interesting. <laughs> this big brother watching you. And I love this. this I, I, I saw this on one of my trips in the United States. This is the crazy Americans going to the gym, but they actually take the escalator up <laughs> instead of climbing the stairs. So we all know that exercise is good, but we don't do it. So what we did in this study is we gamified the exercise. This is called exer gaming. So we had an app specifically designed by, the, by a gaming company. Here's your Parkinson patient sitting on the sofa, not willing to exercise. And now the app says, if you are going to exercise now, your husband will repair the roof. And you think, all right, all right. I'd better exercise. And then the exercise itself is gamified. You remember the 80s Pac-Man study. So they cycle, and then the monsters start to move faster, and the patients need to move faster to catch the monsters. And in the end, they think, ah, I caught 10 monsters. But in effect, they've exercised at 70% cardiac output for 45 minutes. And then afterwards, they can unpack their gifts. You're sitting on the sofa. You've done your exercise. Your husband says, the roof has been fixed. I've just begun washing the dishes. and um, so really exploiting human weaknesses for promoting compliance. And we had a control group with the same motivational app, but they were stretching. So really, the difference is not the app. The difference is aerobic exercise versus stretching. And it was a very comprehensive study where we looked at fitness on the bicycle. Uh, we looked at clinical measures. We even did MRIs before and after. Um, and. Um, the pilot results have been published in JNNP, and I, I just wanted to share this because promoting your Parkinson patients to, to exercise, pushing them, is difficult. What we were asking them to do in the study was exercise for half a year, three times a week, within their designated heart zone. And lo and behold, they did it. I think it's a really compelling finding that they actually, with remote control, a home-based intervention, they were faithful to the intervention. They did it. They even did it slightly better at points where, than what we expected. And this is the pilot data published in JNNP um, showing that they actually became fitter. This was just sort of the, the pilot study. We've done now a large randomized controlled clinical trial in 130 patients powered to find effects on the UPDRS. The papers under review with the Lancet Neurology, we were allowed to send in a revision and I think it'll go in. And if you don't promise to tell anybody else outside this room, it's, it's as good as an add-on therapy for Parkinson's, exercising, which I think is wonderful. 
Uh, you need both. So dual tasking, this is again a study where I was part of, but the real leader was Alice Nielboer in Leuven, who's doing wonderful work in this field. It's called the duality study. Many patients have difficulty dual tasking, doing things at the same time, and the European guideline says there's two options. One is to tell your patients to do things consecutively, to discourage them to dual task. The other one is to say, well, hang on, life is all about multitasking. Maybe you should to train them to handle complex multitask situations. And this is exactly what we did. So we compared one arm where people were... So this is the design. Um, um, dual task training or single task training, um, measurements at baseline, follow-up, and long-term follow-up, and um, 53 patients without freezing and 68 patients with freezing, so a large study. And single task training was doing things separately, consecutively, and multitask training was actually doing walking tasks while they were doing, had cognitive loading during the test. And our outcomes was a trained task, a digit span, just producing serial numbers. Then we had an untrained task, which was actually the primary outcome, the Stroop task. And we had a smartphone task, typing stuff while you were walking, which we thought was a transfer task to see if we could transfer to daily life circumstances. And the interesting thing is, both interventions were effective, but there was no difference between the two interventions. So either discouraging them to dual task and do it consecutively or to train, it was both effective and, it, and, it, and there was retention, it, it, it stuck. So even after washout, it stuck. Um, so um, two baseline findings, we compared them, so they're, they were their own, it was not significant. Um, there was a significant time effect, but no interaction effect and um, uh, and, and, it, um, and there was retention afterwards. So this is important news for physios who can now either use um, consecutive training or dual task training uh, in their patients. So a bit, we're still good for time, yes? About 10 minutes. So we can move to occupational therapy. What I find interesting about occupational therapy is in our group, they are not just treating patients, they are an important source of diagnostic information. And I'm presenting this because what we tend to do is look at these tests. But I don't know whether you can boil an egg with this test. I'm very serious about this. And I remember when we opened our new center, Dutch Television was present, and we had an, a highly educated person, somebody in the government, with Parkinson's, saying how important it was that this new center was opened. And the television crew said, oh, can you pour yourself a glass of milk? It's nice for the television. They had two glasses. And this highly educated man with early PD had a bottle of milk, two glasses, and under pressure, he couldn't make the choice of taking the left or the right, and he was stuck and frozen, a very painful moment in front of the television camera. And you don't see that if you do these tests in your... So that's why OTs have diagnostic value, and I really recommend you also engage them for that purpose. There's now class two evidence for OT in Parkinson's. This is a paper we did in the Lancet Neurology using our well-trained uh, network in the Netherlands to deliver the intervention. And what we randomized here was couples with Parkinson's rather than patients. Uh, we're doing another study now of, of speech and language therapy where we randomize couples instead of patients because you have Parkinson's together and not alone. Um, it's a two-to-one it's, it's two -to uh, uh, inclusion rate and it's either OT according to evidence-based guidelines or practice-based evidence at the time versus uh, usual care. Um, and as an outcome measure, we borrowed from stroke, but this is a personalized outcome. So one challenge in the field of allied health interventions is, if you do an OT intervention and one patient wants to improve writing, the second patient wants to improve um, boiling an egg, you can't use the same outcome measure for both patients. So these, type, these are called personalized outcomes where you prioritize your dire needs, and then you measure whether you improved in, in your problem at baseline. So it's a personalized outcome, which I think is, is important in this field of allied health interventions. So th I realize this is a bit small, but this is the key finding. This is the groups at baseline for the primary outcome, and they're identical at baseline. And as you can see, after three months, 
there's a significant benefit in favor of the intervention group, which even got a bit smaller, but it was still significant uh, after washout. So this is the first time that there's really a well-designed, large-scale, randomized clinical trial showing benefits of occupational therapy. And this is the threshold for a minimal clinically important difference. It's been defined for this primary outcome. And the proportion of people with a meaningful improvement was also significantly greater in favor of the intervention. And again, it stuck after washout. We also did a cost analysis that we published in the Movement Disorders Journal and the take-home message is that overall it wasn't cost effective, well, it, it, it wasn't more expensive, it wasn't cheaper, it was cost neutral, with only in a post hoc sub-analysis some cost benefits for the caregivers. But that's relatively weak. It's safe to say it leads to greater benefit at the same price. That included the cost of the treatment itself. So it, it, it didn't lead to extra costs. Um, it didn't lead to cost savings either. It's a short intervention, so maybe we need more work there. So then speech and language, actually doing well for time. Um, speech and language has three main targets. Uh, dysarthria, dysphagia, and drooling. Um, again, this is the guideline we did in Holland, but we translated it into English, and happy to share it, or you can find it on the Parkinson Ed website. Um, can we have the sound here, please, if possible? Manda. Uh, play it again. So this is his spontaneous speech. And now, purposely speaking... Maandag, dinsdag, woensdag, donderdag, vrijdag, zaterdag, zondag. So even though this is in Dutch, you can clearly hear the difference. So the intervention that speech-language therapists do is speak loud and low. Uh, this is part of the LSVT treatment. Um, the low bit is important. Uh, there's a bit of, believe it or not, OTs have a bit of, uh, speech-language therapists have a bit of a fight between, amongst themselves, because if you speak louder, many patients increase their pitch. So you need to tell them to speak loud and low. And that's, that's actually what we feel is, is best. And I think this is a beautiful example. The problem is, Patients don't hear it, so they have a perceptual problem. I speak fine, you need a hearing aid. So um, they think they speak well, or uh, they think they now need to shout, but in fact their, their voice is too soft. So their perception isn't well, which is one of the reasons why the treatment doesn't stick so well, I think. And don't read this in detail, but there are two Cochrane reviews looking at um, the state of the art, and it's, it's relatively poor for speech and language therapy. But the good news is that Lorraine Ramig, who is leading the field, published this paper in the Movement Disorders Journal, which was one of the first really well-designed RCTs in the field of uh, speech and language. LSVT Loud was what you just heard in the video. LSVT Arctic was promoting better articulation, but not necessarily speaking loud and low. And there was a control group showing no treatment. And this, this is fairly intensive. So it's four times a week for four weeks. So this is a fairly intensive intervention. And patients don't always like this, but I'll come to that in, a, in the final minute of my presentation. And um, don't read this in full detail, but they um, had 81 patients, uh, 25 healthy controls. And so there's four arms here, loud articulation, no care, and even healthy controls. And it was a positive study where both active interventions were better than nothing, but the LSVT loud was superior to the LSVT Arctic. So this is now your first well-designed study, um, and also with a decline over time, but still a significant benefit at the after washout of the treatment. Um, but many questions still remain. Um, Many patients don't like this intensive treatment four times a week going to the hospital. Um, advanced people um, have difficulty traveling. Um, so there are two early day studies looking at tele-speech therapy. So Ray Dorsey in the United States, as you probably know, has done wonderful work on telemedicine for doctors. But I think tele-rehab is the next big kid on the block. So these are two early day trials showing the feasibility of tele-speech therapy, uh, small studies, NS8, NS31. Um, so 
we now just got a grant uh, from the Michael J. Fox Foundation to, look, to do a large RCT of tele speech therapy. And I just wanted to share two things with you. One is um, we use a voice trainer. And the voice trainer is actually already downloadable. Um, we're not making any money out of it, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And it's, it has, it's, it's an app on your smartphone. And the louder you speak, the larger the, uh, the circle becomes. And the lower you speak, the higher. So you get visual feedback online about the quality of your speech, both about loudness and lowness. And it turns red if you're doing not well. So this is the man using it. We can use have sound if you have it. Waarom neemt men een taxi? Een taxi neem je, dan hoef je zelf niet te rijden en niet de weg te zoeken. Dan yeah. de taxi voor jou. Isn't that nice? And it's, it's downloadable. It's called the voice trainer. Um, and I like it because people can use it at home. Um, and particularly because their perception isn't well, now they have online visual feedback. Can I do this? It's one study that I wanted to make. And that's actually really the end of my talk. So. so this is work from England. And to everybody's disappointment, um, this was a, a, a paper in the BMJ showing against everything that we, I think, see, feel, and expect every day. Uh, there was no benefit of Parkinson nurse specialists uh, in this randomized clinical trial, which I think shows more the difficulty in proving that it works, because I think it, it has to work. Um, so this is the final study I wanted to flag. It's a German study by Karsten Eggers, published in Journal of Neurology. Um, it's an RCT of multidisciplinary care, but it's actually a nursing study, to my mind. So. It's an RCT with a caveat that neither patients nor the team members were blinded. The control group was what German neurologists do, is just see a neurologist every three months. Um, the intervention also had the neurologist, so it was a blended approach, but now a nurse paid a home visit. So the difference between the two arms really is the nurse. So to my mind, this is actually a nursing study uh, rather than a multidisciplinary um, study. I thought this was funny because they said they developed an individualized treatment plan. I think, what the heck is the neurologist doing in the control group? Isn't this part of normal medicine? But anyway, um, so home visits and a telephone hotline if needed uh, in between. Um, you can read this faster than I could ever uh, read it up for you. But uh, the groups were identical for neurology care. But the difference really is the nurse, the nurse, the nurse. That's the difference. And. What is interesting about the study, and that's good to bear in mind, is they had 1,100 patients who were not eligible because the distance to travel was too far. So it means that while we are, have these romantic ideas about home visits, it means it, the study was severely biased, and this is not something that's accessible, not in Germany, certainly not in the UK, not in Holland, for every patient. And also, they had a fair amount of dropouts in particular in the control group, because patients, when they were randomized and randomized to usual care, they dropped out. <laughs> Which is, again, the challenge in these non-pharmacological intervention studies. So these two things to keep in mind. Having said that, um, they had the audacity to use quality of life as the primary outcome. The intervention lasted for six months. It took some time for the changes to take place were identical at three months, but there was a significant benefit in favor of the intervention at six months, which was also larger than the minimal clinically relevant difference. So to my mind, this is one of the first studies to demonstrate the added value of nurses, with a caveat of the lack of blinding and the huge selection bias, but it's encouraging that at least we're beginning to see some evidence for Parkinson nurses now. So that is my final slide. Um, collaboration is the new competition. I'm a strong believer in multidisciplinary care. And um, it gives me great fun. It gives me great fun to study it with all its challenges. Um, and again, collaboration, um, Sarah, Peter, is also between our Dutch team and your team. And I really look forward to many more years of having fun together and bringing this to the fore. Thank you. So the answer to the question? Not an evidence-free zone. There's, ev there's loads of evidence for multidisciplinary work. There is loads. Of, there's Absolutely. increasingly good evidence. Yeah. Okay. Any quick questions? We've got a couple of minutes. 
Anyone want to question the uh, n equals one research approach, which I think is uh, oh, there's fascinating. There's one question in the back. Then. Oh yes, sorry. Thank you very much for another excellent talk. I'm learning so much. Thank you. Um, I always advise my patients to exercise, and your studies show that the more physically fit they get, the better they are. Uh, and I'm always stumped by what to tell them to do about upper limb exercise, because that's not a gross motor task. That's about what type of? Upper limb function. Oh, upper limb. Ah, yeah. So what yeah. do do with their hands? They can exercise their legs and their heart, but what do you do with their arms? Yeah. Um, no, so um, if you may remember, the, when I showed the targets of physiotherapy, dexterity uh, is a physiotherapy goal. Um, so yes, upper limb exercises is part of the physiotherapy repertoire. This is where OT and speech and, and physiotherapy overlap. There's one paper in neurology where they had upper limb exercises. It was a really interesting study where the effect of physiotherapy was greater if patients were trained while they were on. So they had people trained while they were off and people while trained while... <coughs> while they were on and the effect of the non-pharmacologic intervention was greater if you added it, mixed it with medication. So, so yes, it should be part of the repertoire. Yeah. Please. Just uh, the PD rehab thing that you mentioned that had the negative. So yeah. the PD. I'm Jason Raw. Hello. Yeah. The PD uh, rehab study that you mentioned uh, that had the negative results. I, I helped recruit people for that study, and I remember it. And it's true that people were uh, excluded if they were thought to be in need of right. therapy. But that was because of for, for ethical reasons. If we, if we thought somebody needed therapy, we weren't allowed to ethically deny them it by putting them into a study where they could be randomized to no therapy. So uh, it made sense to us at the time why that was in the protocol. How are you getting around ethically... Right. Uh, yep. denying people therapy if you think they need it? Yeah, I think, no, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think in all fairness, at the time, probably when PD rehab started, and at the time, for example, when we did our OT study, there was at best practice-based evidence, but not real evidence-based practice. So, for example, in our OT trial, we felt... <laughs> the last one. We thought it was perfectly fine to allocate people to usual care, which is, which is usual care in the Netherlands means you don't get to see an OT. Um, and there was no evidence for OT, so we felt that the intervention arm was given something extra that was at the time not evidence-based. And I think when PD rehab, so it's going fast in the physiotherapy field, so for OT it's easier. For PT, I'm with you. I, the evidence is growing, although still there is no class one evidence. So you could still rightfully argue, you know, if, if this was a drug, we wouldn't have a problem doing a phase three trial for a drug. And, and we're having difficulty doing a phase three study for physiotherapy. So I, in all fairness, I think given the state of the evidence, I still think it's ethically justified to do RCTs when there is no real evidence. Does it make sense or? W would you agree the trial wasn't negative, though, Baz, because it was an ill-defined question answered incorrectly? So, I, I, again, I think that was the least successful trial from the Birmingham yeah. group, and I think, again, it, it highlights the difficulties in designing studies. And your Absolutely. point is interesting. It's, yeah, it is. It, it may be because uh, in the design of that trial, the NICE guidelines were already out and already yeah. recommending physiotherapy, occupational Absolutely. therapy, and speech therapy. Yes, exactly. Mm. Yeah. That, that's another challenge, of course. So the, the, the contamination of the control group. So we've also had negative studies. I mean, I'm showing a few positive. We've had negative studies where contamination, where the control group, because we all talk about exercise and the importance, the control group actually diluted the effect in the intervention arm. So that's another challenge. And then the other thing that I didn't mention is, for example, in these exercise studies, we had a paper in the BMJ and another exercise study where the most sedentary people refused to be randomized. So the people who were already active wanted to join a sports study, but they were the ones who needed it least. So there's all these problems in these non-pharmacological studies. Okay, uh, I think we're going to move on. Um, the references and some of the PDFs will be on yeah, our website. Yeah, I'll work with Sarah to we'll make sure that you get them. the references. Which yeah. will be a fantastic resource. Baz, thank you so much for that, as ever. Brilliant. <laughs>